Good morning, everybody. We're going to start off now at the top of the hour. This is going to be a webcast where we're going to take our first looks at SNP and Variation Suite 7 Installment 4. My name is Gabe Rudy. I'm the Vice President of Product Development here at Golden Helix, and I'm joined by Dr. Bryce Christensen, who is our Director of our Services Division and also our in-house biostatistician. What we're going to do today is really cover some of the amazing new things we've been working on in the past six months. This is the SNP and Variation Suite 7.4 has over 30 new features. We're not going to be able to cover all of them, but we are definitely going to try to hit the highlights, give you a teaser of this, and there'll be plenty of ways for you to continue on in your understanding of SPS and, and interaction with us. A part of our commitment to our ongoing customers is to always add, expand our, our existing features into include new methods, new quality assurance, and make speed optimizations, but also is we are going to be in the business of keeping up with what is the new and greatest scientific methods and markets to look at. In that vein, we've been looking at the sequence analysis market. And of course, it's the next generation sequencing machines have been in a very exciting evolution of technology to be watching. And I've been doing this over the past couple of years. What I did is in the series of three blog posts, I outlined most of these things I'm going to be talking to you today about from the history of some of these sequencing methods, the hardware to the advancements in their costs, different models people use them in. And finally, also, I covered in part two and three some of the analysis methods that you use for sequencing. You can also go look at this information in my blog posts, but I'm going to give you a quick introduction here so that I can provide the proper context in describing our new features. It's exciting to see all this technology come to bear with the competition of our hardware vendors. And if you noticed here on this graph of cost per gigabase pair, the drop is not just linear. I mean, the scale on the side here is in a logarithmic form. It's outpacing Moore's law, and it's really making using the direct sequencing of DNA and RNA information a very viable tool for any researcher. And what's really driving this besides just the technology cost is a couple trends in how people are acquiring their sequence data. First is the ability for large service providers such as the centralized labs that you see from Beijing Genome Institute, the Broad Institute, and the Illumina Genome Network to be able to set up very optimized quality assurance focused pipelines in providing the analysis tools and the sequencing work for your studies and then being able to ship you hard drive or other forms of data to be able to do that. If you talk to Illumina, they will also tell you that 70% of their machines that they sell are going to sequencing centers or institutions that have never had a sequencing machine. And this is what people have termed the democratization of sequencing. The hardware is becoming affordable and it's becoming a very popular and effective tool to be put to bear under research terms. So another reason that people are taking a look at this is not just of it being cost effective, but if you look at the common disease, common variant hypothesis that was really some of the underlying methodology behind the genome-wide association study a method design, there was the assumption that we would be able to find the large amount of our inheritable trait being attributed to our common diseases because the traits themselves were fairly common. We should be able to find them inside common variants. And as we move forward, people are exploring more and more combined effect or the individual effect of rare variants in explaining missing heritability and finding interesting variant causal relationships with traits of interest. So what I'm going to do now is describe a little bit about how people are able to make sense of all the different steps that we see in, in processing next generation sequencing data. And this workflow and this breakdown right now, I'm going to stay specific to DNA analysis, the analysis of DNA sequence data. It will be a similar workflow and very similar steps for the analysis of RNA data, but DNA data has been traditionally our strength and it is a very apt way to talk about these things as we transition into looking at our product. Primary analysis of sequence data is really about taking what comes off of the machine and putting it into a digital form that represents the base pairs themselves. Machines, the next generation sequencing machines, are often based on either a optics and camera based system of actually reading the chemistry as the sequencing happens, or they may actually be doing a direct detection, but turning that signal information from those machines into both base pair calls, with your AGCs and Ts, and the quality scores for those is what primary analysis is about. And you have to keep up with the machine as it produces this large amount of data to be able to process that in pace. But in secondary analysis, you're not just streaming that information into another pipeline. You have to aggregate it on a sample level or multiple sample level to be able to do things like align your 
short little shotgun reads to a reference genome or do your own de novo assembly of those reads. And finally, you want to do things like call the variants, call the places in the genome of your aligned reads that vary between your reference genome and your samples genome. So now we have, through the secondary analysis pipeline, something that comes out that looks much like in proportional to the size of data that you see in microarray. Uh, it's going to be on the order of millions of variants that are different between individual human samples, for example, proportional for other biological samples. And then now you get into the phase that we call tertiary analysis, right? So tertiary analysis is the handling of not just a single sample for alignment or variant calling, but aggregating multiple samples into the context that makes sense for that study. Being able to do the quality assurance and quality control on those variant calls, being able to bring in the phenotype information, and really what we're able to do what we want to do is leverage the large amount of public data sources that are already been done, like the Thousand Genomes Project in providing population information and other, um, other uh, annotation information on the genome of interest to be able to make sense of that data. So if you look at the current uh, software offerings in this space as far as analysis tools, the primary analysis is really being handled quite well and, 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 and quite naturally by the platform providers themselves. Uh, Illumina, as it makes its machines, knows it's the most there is to know about its lasers and its um, optics and is able to provide uh, good support for the tools to turn those into base calls. Um, in secondary analysis, where you're doing this assembly and alignment, a lot of open source uh, academic packages for the single purpose of doing this type of work have been developed, have been already uh, vetted in the marketplace, are at a high level of quality, and all those individual packages are starting to be aggregated into pipelines. Um, most of these types of tools are run in a server-side environment where you have clusters of machines with giant network-attached storage devices with petabytes of data, potentially, if you're doing this in a, in a large scale to be able to handle the large amount of data coming off the machine and run it in a very consistent way with a lot of quality control checks. Um, a package like Galaxy is really one of these umbrella workflow, workflow packages. It's able to run on your server, integrate a bunch of single source, uh, a single purpose tools, and provide a repeatable workflow for running through that primary and secondary analysis pipeline. A CLC Bio is a commercial offering that we, we've been um, in contact with CLC before. They've um, been a, uh, a strong company in this type of field. They've been doing a lot of RNA analysis and both DNA analysis, but their product is also very focused on handling the uh, single sample scale of, of data processing, and it's also fairly focused on the primary and secondary analysis of doing things like variant calls and, and, and uh, um, sequence assembly, etc. So what has really been missing in the field is some way to integrate all of these types of uh, tertiary analysis workflows into one integrated tool. And that means being able to import, do all this type of uh, quality assurance tests, and then do the, the, the broad spectrum of downstream workflows that people might want to do. And this is where we really think Golden Helix uh, SVS is going to be positioned, and we're happy to be able to, in our 7.4 release, showcase our offering in this, in this space. So what does it mean when we say we're going to provide an integrated uh, tertiary analysis tool for sequence data? Well, really targeting is to start off the whole exome and whole genome targeted resequencing uh, study design. And that's not just for people who have such as in the, in the genome-wide association study, study design thousands of samples, and that is something that SVS is very capable of handling. We've, uh, we've done studies with tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of samples, but it's also if you just have a few samples, you may have a couple trios from families, you're able to use SVS to be able to do the type of sequence workflows you might want to do. And those workflows include doing things like variant filtering to identify your causal variants and a new association methods. We have a whole slew of tools for, for doing association methods with microarray data, but those association tests are not necessarily appropriate for testing rare variants, and we'll go into more details about that later. 
And finally, if you're looking at rare variants, you have so many to look at, you need to look at how other ways other than just filtering based on, say, external populations of understanding their significance in your, in your samples. And so functional prediction is another way of doing that and where you're trying to predict if this variant is causing um, in the transcript of the, uh, of the RNA and then the protein transcript a potentially damaging change in the, in the genome. So what we're going to do here is just give you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about whole genome um, uh, sequencing data and how many variants you would expect to find, how many variants you would expect to need to uh, filter down to, and the, the scale of the data that's going to be looked at. And unlike microarray data where you've already have your assay of so many sites that are going to be probed on the genome, uh, sequencing data is going to be able to provide you with every single variant in confidence that it's able to provide you with. Um, that is in the actual samples themselves. And the Thousand Genomes Project has provided us with, um, in the last couple years, a great understanding of, of what does that actually mean at, in large sample sizes. So for their phase one data, they have 621 samples, and they were able to identify 25 million unique variant sites. And then 15 million of those have frequencies of below 2% in the population. Um, and, and how many of those are rare versus a common is, is something that's of interest. If you look at dbSNP-129, which is the catalog of, of variants in, in the human population, that 129 version is considered the last version that has more or less the common variants before 1,000 genomes started to catalog more and more deeply through their sequencing efforts, um, rare variants. And there are 7.9 million variants in dbSNP-129. So those will be maybe the common variants versus, say, those 15 million that might be below 2% as the rare variants. On a single sample level, you might expect to find 4 million variants on a whole genome scale. And at a whole exome scale, maybe about 20,000 variants. And 250 to 300 of those will be loss of function variants if you, if you were to actually get down to the biological significance of every single one of those. And 50 to 100 of those will probably have been implicated in previous diseases. So this is just to give you an idea of the fact that it's not just about retrieving that variant information from your core labs or your sequencing provider. There's much work to be done and just understanding um, what, you know, to just be able to, to filter through those variants and put them into the context of your study. So what we're going to do next is give you a little pictorial example of how to look at variants in the context of genes. What we're, what we're saying is in the GWAS uh, study design, you're looking at common variants only. And when you're looking at sequencing data and people are interested in understanding the rare variant burden, what they're doing is saying in a known genome in, uh, region of interest, most commonly defined as genes, how many rare variants might I have in the cases and controls? And this is in a, an association study design for your uh, case control study design for sequence data. In our tracks here, we just have five samples of, of controls and five samples of cases and a couple genes and two known SNPs inside this area. So these two, so one workflow would be to filter out the common variants, which are going to be of those known SNPs. And if we remove those, and then we also look at removing any variants that are outside of our genes. Those might be a non-coding DNA and aren't of interest for understanding the rare variants in genes. Now you have an idea of the, the variants inside your controls and cases in this region. And you can do multiple ways of actually testing that rare variant burden. A very common workflow is simply to get an understanding of if there are variants in this gene per sample. And so this is kind of a binary aggregation on this level saying gene one has one, at least one variant and, and uh, for this sample and, and this sample and this sample. And in the, in the cases there are four uh, samples that have variants in that genes. And you could also do this in not just in a binary sense, but actually count the number of very variants. And so here we have now this gene one has a couple variants in controls, but cases there's actually more than one variance for those. And this is just giving you a preview of the type of, of new methods that people are going to look forward to in understanding their sequence data. 